Good morning, YouTube. Today we'll be continuing Zachariah Sitchin's Twelfth Planet with the beginning of the fourth chapter titled Sumer, Land of the Gods. There is no doubt that the olden words, which for thousands of years constituted the language of higher learning and religious scriptures, was the language of Sumer. There is also no doubt that the olden gods were the gods of Sumer. Records and tales and genealogies and histories of gods older than those pertaining to the gods of Sumer have not been found anywhere. When these gods in their original Sumerian forms, or in later Akkadian, Babylonian, or Assyrian, are named and counted, the list runs into hundreds. But once they are classified, it is clear that, that they were not a hodgepodge of divinities. They were headed by a pantheon of great gods, governed by an assembly of the, of the deities, and related to each other. Once the numerous lesser nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and the like are excluded, a much smaller and coherent group of deities emerges, each with a role to play, each with certain powers or responsibilities. There were, the Sumerians believed, gods that were of the heavens, texts dealing with the time before things were created. Talk of such heavenly gods as Aspu, Apsu, Tiamat, Anshar, Kishar, excuse me. No claim is ever made that the gods of this category ever appeared upon earth. As we look closer at these gods, who existed before Earth was created, we shall realize that they were the celestial bodies that make up our solar system. And as we shall show, the so-called Sumerian myths regarding these celestial beings are, in fact, precise and scientifically plausible cos cosmologic concepts regarding the creation of our solar system. There were also lesser gods who were of Earth. Their cult centers were mostly provincial provincial towns there were no more than local deities at best they were given charge of some limited operation as for example the goddess Nin Kashi which is Lady Beer who supervised the preparation of beverages of them no heroic tales were told they possessed no awesome weapons and the other gods did not shudder at their command. They remind one very much of the company of young gods that marched last in the procession depicted on the rocks of Hittite Yazilikaya. Between the two groups, there were the gods of heaven and earth, the ones called the ancient gods. They were the olden gods of the epic tales, and, the, and in the Sumerian belief, they had come down to earth from the heavens. These were no mere local deities. They were national gods indeed, international gods. Some of them were present and active upon earth even before the, there were men upon earth. Indeed, the very existence of man was deemed to have been the result of a deliberate creative enterprise on the part of these gods. They were powerful, capable of feats beyond mortal ability or comprehension. Yet these gods not only looked like humans, but ate and drank like them, and displayed virtually every human emotion of love and hate, loyalty and infidelity. Although the roles and hierarchical standing of some of the principal deities shift over, over the millennia, a number of them never lost their paramount position and their national and international veneration. As we take a close look at the central group, there emerges a picture of a dynasty of gods, a divine family, closely, closely related, yet bitterly divided. The head of this family of gods of heaven and earth was An, 
or Anu in the Babylonian Assyrian text. He was the great father of the gods, king of the gods. His realm was the expanse of the heavens, and his symbol was a star. In the Sumerian pictographic writing, the sign of a star also stood for An, or heavens, and for a divine being or god, descendant of An. This fourfold meaning of the symbol remained through the ages as the script moved from Sumerian pictographic to the cuneiform Akkadian to the stylized Babylonian and Assyrian in figure 43. And uh, figure 43 up at the top here, everyone, is what we just read is uh, how they incorporate on being the star, heavens, God. And there's a symbol for each of those terms. From the very earliest times until the cuneiform script faded away from the 4th millennium BC almost to the time of Christ, this symbol preceded the names of the gods, indicating that the name written in the text was not of a mortal, but of a deity of heavenly origin. Anu's abode and the seat of his kingship was in the heavens. That was where the other gods of heaven and earth went when they needed individual advice or favor, or where they met in assembly to settle disputes among themselves or to reach major decisions. Numerous texts describe Anu's palace, whose portals were guarded by a god of the tree of truth and a god of the tree of life. His throne, the manner in which other gods approached him, and how they sat in his presence. The Sumerian text could also recall instances when not only other gods but even some chosen mortals were permitted to go up to Anu's abode, mostly with the object of escaping mortality. One such tale pertained to Adapa, the model of man. He was so perfect and so loyal to the god Ea who created him that Ea arranged for him to be taken to Anu. Ea then describe to Adapa what to expect. Adapa, thou art go before Anu, the king. The road to heaven thou wilt take, when to heaven thou hast ascended, and hast approached the gate of Anu, the bearer of life and the grower of truth, at the gate of Anu will be standing. Guided by his creator, Adapa to the heaven went up, ascended to heaven, and approached the gate of Anu. But when he was offered the chance to become immortal, Adapa refused to eat the bread of life, thinking that the angry Anu offered him poisoned food. He was thus returned to earth an anointed priest, but still immortal. The Sumerian claimed that not, not only gods, but also selected mortals could ascend to the divine abode in the heavens it is echoed in the Old Testament tales of the ascents to the heavens by Enoch and the prophet Elijah. Though Anu lived in a heavenly abode, the Sumerian texts reported instances when he came down to earth, either at times of great crisis or on ceremonial visits when he was accompanied by his spouse Antu or at least once, to make his great-granddaughter, Inanna, his consort on earth. Since he did not permanently reside on earth, there was apparently no need to grant him exclusivity over his own city or cult center, and the abode or high house erected for him was located at Uruk, the biblical Eric, the domain of the goddess Inanna. The ruins of Uruk include to this day a huge man-made mound where archaeologists have found evidence of the construction and reconstruction of a high temple, the Temple of Anu. No less than 18 strata or distinct phases were discovered there, indicating the existence of compelling reasons to maintain the temple at that sacred site. The Temple of Anu was called Iana, House of An, but this simple name applied to a structure that, at least at some of its phases, was quite a sight to behold. It was according to Sumerian texts, the hollowed Iana, the pure sanctuary. Traditions maintained that the great gods themselves had fashioned its parts. Its, its cornice was like copper, its great wall touching the clouds, a lofty dwelling place. 
It was a house whose charm was irresistible, whose allure was unending, and the text also made clear the temple's purpose, for they called it the house for descending from heaven. A tablet that belonged to an archive at Uruk enlightens us as to the pomp and pageantry that accompanied the, the arrival of Anu and his spouse on a state visit. Because, because of damage to the tablet, we can read of the ceremonies only from, from some midpoint when Anu and Antu were already seated in the temple's courtyard. The gods, exactly in the same order as before, then formed the procession ahead, ahead of and behind the, bear, the bearer of the scepter. The protocol then instructed, <clears throat> They shall then descend to the exalted court and shall turn towards the god Anu. The priests of purification shall liberate the scepter and the scepter bearer shall enter and be seated. The deities Papsukal, Nusku, and Shala shall be seated shall then be seated in the court of the god Anu. Meanwhile the goddesses, the divine offspring of Anu, Uruk's divine daughters, bore a second object whose name or purpose are unclear to the Enir, the house of the golden bed of the goddess Antu. Then they returned in a procession to the courtyard to the place where Antu was seated. While, while the evening meal was being prepared according to a strict ritual, a special priest smeared a mixture of good oil and wine on the floor, uh, wine on the door sockets of the sanctuary to which Anu and Antu were later to retire for the night. A thoughtful touch in, intended it seems, to eliminate squeaking of the doors while the two deities slept. While in evening meal, various drinks and appetizers was being served, and an, an astronomer priest went up to the, up the topmost stage of the tower of the main temple to observe the skies. He was to look out for the rising in a specific part of the sky of the planet named Great Anu of Heaven. Thereupon, he was to recite the compositions named to, named to the one who grows bright, the heavenly planet of the Lord Anu, and the Creator's image has risen. Once the planet had been sighted and poems recited, Anu and Antu washed their hands with water out of a golden basin at the first part of the feast, and the first part of the feast began. Then the seven great gods also washed their hands from seven large golden trays, and the second part of the feast began. The rite of washing of the mouth was then performed. The, pri the priest recited the hymn, The planet of Anu is heaven's hero. Torches were lit, and the gods, priests, singers, and food bearers arranged themselves in a procession, accompanying the two visitors to their sanctuary for the night. Get a drink, everybody. Four major deities were assigned to remain in the courtyard and keep watch until daybreak. Others were stationed at various designated gates. Meanwhile, the whole country was to light up and celebrate the presence of the two divine visitors. On a signal from the main temple, the priests of all the other temples of Uruk were, were to use torches to start bonfires, and the priests in other cities seeing the bonfires at Uruk were to do likewise. Then, the people of the land shall light fires in their homes and shall offer banquets to all the gods. The guards of the cities shall light fires in the streets and in the squares. The departure of the two great gods was also planned, not only to the day, but to the minute. On the seventeenth day, forty minutes after sunrise, the gates shall be opened for before the gods Anu and Antu, bringing to an end their overnight stay. While the end of this tablet was broken off, 
Another text in all probability describes the departure, the morning meal, the incantations, the handshakes, grasping of the hands by the other gods. The great gods were then carried to the point of departure on throne-like litters carried on the shoulders of temple functionaries. In a Syrian depiction of a procession of deities, though from a much later time, probably gives us a good idea of the manner in which Anu and Antu were carried during the procession in Uruk in figure 44. Special incantations were recited when the procession was passing through the street of the gods. Other psalms and hymns were sung as the procession neared the holy quay, and when it reached the dike of the ship of Anu. Goodbyes were then said, and yet more incantations were recited and sung, with hand-raising gestures. And this is the uh, figure 44, showing their little party of Anu and Antu's departure. Then all the priests and temple functionaries who carried the gods, led by the great priest, offered a special prayer of departure. Great Anu, may heaven and earth bless you, they intoned seven times. They prayed for the blessing of the seven celestial gods and invoked the gods that were in, in heaven and the gods that were upon earth. In conclusion, they bade farewell to Anu and Antu thus. May the gods of the deep and the gods of the divine abode bless you. May they bless you daily, every day of every month of every year. Among the thousands upon thousands of depictions of the ancient gods that have been uncovered, none seems to depict Anu. Yet he peers at us from every statue and every portrait of every king that, was, that ever was, from antiquity to our very own days, for Anu was not only the great king, the king of gods, but also the one by whose grace others could be crowned as kings. By Sumerian tradition, rulership followed from Anu, and the very term for kingship was Anutu, Anuship. The insignia, the insignia of Anu were the tiara, the divine headdress, the scepter, the symbol of power, and the staff symbolizing the guidance provided by the shepherd. The shepherd's staff may now be found more in the hands of bishops than of kings, but the crown and scepter are still held by whatever kings mankind has left on some thrones. The second most powerful deity of the Sumerian pantheon was Enlil. His name meant Lord of the Airspace the prototype and father of the later storm gods that were to head the that were to head the pantheons of the ancient world he was a new's eldest son born at his father's heavenly abode but at some point in the earliest times he descended to earth and was thus the principal god of heaven and earth when the gods met in assembly at the heavenly abode and lil presided over the meetings alongside his father when the gods met, excuse me, everyone. Thank you. When the gods met for an assembly on earth, they met at Enlil's court in the divine precinct of Nippur, the city dedicated to Enlil and the site of his main temple, the Akur, house which is like a mountain. Not only the Sumerians, but the very gods of Sumer considered Enlil supreme. They called him ruler of all the lands and made it clear that in the heaven he is the prince on earth. He is the chief. His word or command high above made the heavens tremble, down below made the earth quake. <clears throat> and Lil, whose, com whose command is far reaching, whose word is lofty and holy, whose pronouncement is unchangeable who decrees destinies unto the distant future, 
The gods of earth bow down willingly before him. The heavenly gods who are on earth humble themselves before him. They stand by faithfully according to instructions. And Lil, according to Sumerian beliefs, arrived on earth well before earth became settled and civilized. A hymn to Enlil, the all-beneficent, re recounts the many aspects of society and civilization that would not have existed had it, had it not had been for Enlil's instructions to execute his orders far and wide. No cities would be built, no settlements founded. No stalls would be built, no, she no sheep folds erected, no king would be raised, no high priest born. The Sumerian text also stated that, that Enlil arrived on earth before the black-headed people. The Sumerian nickname for mankind were, were created. During such uh, pre-mankind times, Enlil erected Nippur as his center, or com uh, command post, at which heaven and earth were connected through some bond. The Sumerian text called the bond of Dur Anki, bond of heaven on earth, and used poetic language to describe Enlil's first actions on earth. Enlil, when you marked off divine settlements on earth, Nippur you set up as your very own city, the city of earth, the lofty, your pure place whose water is sweet. You founded the Duranki in the center of the four corners of the world. In those early days when gods alone inhabited Nippur and man had not been created, Enlil met the goddesses who was to become his wife. According to one version, Enlil saw his future bride while he was bathing in Nippur's stream naked. It was love at first sight, but not necessarily with marriage in mind. The shepherd Enlil who decrees the fates, the bright-eyed one, saw her. The Lord speaks to her of intercourse. She is unwilling. Enlil speaks to her of intercourse. She is unwilling. My vagina is too small, she said. It knows no copulation. My lips are too little. They know not kissing. But Enlil did not take no for an answer. He disclosed to his chamberlain, Nushku, his burning desire for the young maid who was called Sud, the nurse, and who lived with her her mother at Iresh, the scented house. Nushku suggested a boat ride and brought up a boat, and Lil persuaded Sud to go sailing with him. Once they were in the boat, he raped her. The ancient tale then relates that through Enlil was chief Though Enlil was chief of the gods, they were so enraged that they seized him and banished him to the lower world. Enlil, immoral one, they shouted at him, Get thyself out of the city. This version has, has it that Sud, pregnant with Enlil's child, followed him and he married her. Another version has the repentant Enlil searching for the girl and sending his chamberlain to her mother to ask for the girl's hand. One way or another, Sud did become of the wife of Enlil, and he bestowed on her the title Ninlil, Lady of the Airspace. But little did he and the gods who banished him know that it was not Enlil who had seduced Ninlil, but the other way around. The truth of the matter was, that Ninlil bathed naked in the stream on her mother's instructions with the hope that Enlil, who customarily took his walks by the stream, would notice Ninlil and wish to forthwith embrace you, kiss you. In spite of the manner in which the two fell for each other, Ninlil was held in the highest esteem once she was given by Enlil, <clears throat> the garment of ladyship. With one exception which, we believe, had to do with dynast dynastic succession, and Lil is never known to have had other indiscretions. A votive tablet found at Nippur shows Enlil and Ninlil being served food and beverage at their temple. The tablet was commissioned by Ur Enlil, the domestic of Enlil, in figure 45, next, next page. 
apart from being chief of the gods, Enlil was also deemed the supreme lord of Sumer, sometimes simply called the land, and its black-headed people. A Sumerian psalm spoke in the veneration of this, of this god. Lord who knows the destiny of the land, trustworthy in his calling. Enlil who knows the destiny of Sumer, trustworthy in his calling. Father Enlil, Lord of all the lands. Father Enlil, Lord of the rightful command. Father Enlil, shepherd of the black-headed ones. From the mountains of sunrise to the mountain of sunset. There is no other lord in the land. You are alone. You, you alone are king. And at the top, everyone is the mentioned depiction on the previous page. Of the servant serving Enlil and Ninlil. If you guys can make that out right there. And below him is the underworld, what they're referring to. The Sumerians revered Enlil out of both fear and gratitude. It was he who made sure that decrees by the assembly of the gods were carried out against mankind. It was his wind that blew obliterating storms against of offending cities. It was he who, at the time of the deluge, sought the destruction of mankind. But when at peace with mankind, he was a friendly god who bestowed favors. According to the Sumerian text, the knowledge of farming together with the plow and the pickaxe, were granted to mankind by Enlil. Enlil also selected the kings who were to rule over mankind, not as sovereigns but as servants of the god, entrusted with the administration of divine laws of justice. Accordingly, Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian kings opened their inscriptions of self-adoration by describing how Enlil had called them to kingship. These calls, issued by Enlil on behalf of himself and his father Anu, granted legitimacy to the ruler and outlined his functions. Even Hammurabi, who had acknowledged a god named Marduk as the national god of Babylon, prefaced his code of laws by stating that Anu and, and Enlil named me to, to promote the welfare of the people, to cause justice to prevail in the land. God of heaven and earth, firstborn of Anu, dispenser of kingship, chief executive of the assembly of gods, father of gods, of, father of gods and men, grantor of agriculture, lord of the airspace. These were some of the attributes of Enlil that bespoke his greatness and powers. His command was far-reaching, his pronouncements unchangeable. He decreed the destinies. He possessed the bond heaven earth. And from his awesome city, Nippur, he could raise the beams that searched the heart of all the lands. Eyes that could scan all the lands. Yet he was as human as, as any young man enticed by a naked beauty. Subject to moral laws imposed by the community of the gods, transgressions of which were punishable by banishment. And not even immune to mortal complaints. At least in one known instance, a Sumerian king of Ur complained directly to the assembly of the gods that a series of troubles that had befallen Ur and her people could be traced back to the ill-fated fact that Enlil did give the kingship to a worthless man who was not of Sumerian seed. As we go along, we shall see the central role that Enlil played the divine and mortal affairs on earth and how his several sons battled among, among themselves and with others for the divine succession, undoubtedly giving rise to the later tales of the battles of the gods. And we'll go ahead and stop there, guys. So it's, uh, I'm trying to break up this chapter because it's like a, 
almost a 45 page chapter so we'll try and do it in four parts and we'll go ahead and stop there thank you everyone for being a part of my reading of my ex explorations here thank you i appreciate you appreciate you all thank you